Welcome everyone to another episode of the Shaman's Way podcast. As always, this episode comes from the teachings of our amazing friend and shaman in residence, Cricket. We hope you're enjoying these podcasts as much as we enjoy making them, and I'd like to take just a moment to ask you if you would please leave us a rating and a comment in iTunes or whichever podcast player you're listening to us from. Giving us a rating and sharing this podcast with others is the biggest way you can tell us that you like our show. Now, without further ado, on with the episode. Well, hello, my constant listener, and hello, my semi-constant listener, and a very special welcome and hello to my brand new listener. Today, I want to chat about the thin line. What do I mean by the thin line? I'm going to get you there. Don't you worry there, little listener. So I, from my perspective, uh, there is a very thin line. How thin would be especially up to you, my listener, between what is cultural appropriation and what is not. And as much as I would like to draw this line of distinction for you, I cannot. We are all coming to our spiritual place, utilizing different routes, different beliefs, and different structures. Why am I talking about this? Well, I came across this subject when I was researching some insight into the word conjurer, as Lynn Andrews used it in her mystery school. I came across blog post after blog post, as you can imagine, discrediting her, her work, and more so where she got her training from. Now, I know, I know I sound like a broken record when I remind you there were very few authors writing about shamanic training and skills when I was first introduced to this form. But that doesn't mean that uh, that lying is a great way to, or misappropriating your beliefs, or misappropriating other people's beliefs is how you should, you know, present yourself. Whether she did that or not, I don't know. I really don't know. I've never read any Carlos Castaneda book cover to cover. The writing is just not in a style I find particularly engaging, and I know there's been quite a bit of controversy over Carlos Castaneda. I have found that authors uh, through the years have changed their titles and even some the format of what they teach, and hopefully This is in part because of the outcry of American Indians and the very real fight against cultural appropriation. I have heard many people through the years criticize, and some more vocally than others, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. I have shared with you, my dear listeners, that in the past I organized teaching seminars for the Foundation where I live in Alberta. I At that time, I didn't have the funds or the time available to pursue advanced training through it. I was able to bring the very short weekend workshops into Edmonton and and take it that. I have never taken the three-year advanced training program for various reasons. But what I had heard at one point is that the you learn in those three years you learn 72 different healing techniques through that program and then you're able to incorporate them into your own toolkit and from I don't know if this is still true however I know that they used to uh, make all students sign a non-disclosure clause so that whatever they learned there they couldn't share specifically with others which I find kind of ironic in a sense One of the reasons why I liked the foundation and their workshops or basic workshops was because the tenements of the basic workshops was that the techniques taught were global and not specific to any one particular culture. And that appealed to me because I, at that time even, I didn't feel like I was appropriating from one or another specific culture. I'm not sure that there are 72 healing techniques which are universally similar. But I suspect one or possibly more are very close to appropriation, if not, you know, frankly, stepping right in it. I want to look at some of the possible reasons why us, the tribalist society, why we have used search and seek 
as you know, we've used different ways to search and seek, uh, the ways to deepen our connection to the world around us. We've often heard it termed and read it termed as the New Age movement. So in some part of it, I'm going to discuss it and, or use the New Age as a term. But that's, I mean, that's a term that I, I kind of like and kind of don't like. It's, it's a huge umbrella term. It can specify and pick up pretty much anything within that umbrella movement. It is a movement that is a larger context of the consumer culture and the increasing lifestyles, identity, cultural, and even spiritual meaning have become commodities for purchase. So more and more, I find that we are inundated by images, by styles, and representations moving beyond, you know, even mere promotional accessories. But they have become economically very useful products. In our present consumer culture, we have a romanticized representation of Native Indian spirituality. In fact, we all know that it has become a product to be purchased and consumed and really does engender quite a lot of frustration, anger, and justifiably with respect to stolen identity and stolen property, stolen appropriation of ideas. The I think a, a large part of this, you know, again, we come back to that consumer culture, we come back to that romanticized notion of it. So here in that romanticized notion, what we have is we have a product that can be either purchased or consumed, but these products capitalize on being exoticized or other. And that's really very appealing. So we are now, we're consuming spiritual goods and ideas as a means to recover a displaced cultural meaning. Now, displaced, what I mean by that is deliberately removed from daily life of a community and displaced onto a distant cultural domain by romanticizing or exoticizing another culture. Today, I think some spirituality is placed squarely in the supermarket of lifestyles. Individuals were able to select from a series of packaged bodies of meaning systems. And you can take that to mean anything. Well, and meaning systems. What is a meaning system? A meaning system could be yoga. A meaning system could be Buddhism. A meaning system could be, you know, any number of X, Y, Zs. Right? What is a packaged body, an unpackaged meaning system? How many of us 35, 40 years ago knew the word chakras? knew what they represented, these wheels of light, these wheels of movement. How many of us 50 years ago knew, you know, specifically about Ayurvedic medicine or Ayurvedic thought patterns, or not thought patterns, but Ayurvedic teachings? So these things really do change. So we have displaced onto a distant culture. We romanticize it. We've exoticized it. In our tendency, in our 3D reality, in this reality we live in, for our spiritual-minded pursuits, we have those spiritual-minded pursuits purchased in the market like any other consumer culture lifestyle. And I find that, you know, obvious, and yet I find it distasteful. I contribute to the obvious, even though I find it somewhat distasteful. So, you know, in, in a way, I'm sitting on a fence because I, I have a, a podcast that goes, and I teach what I understand of shamanism, and much of it has been gained simply through my own experiences, my own experiences with spirit, as well as the you know, some of the exhaustive research I've done into different techniques, as well as into my own Finnish heritage and what practices my ancestors used in their, in their daily life in order to keep them spiritually aware, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, emotionally healthy. So we do have a series of packaged bodies of meaning systems. There is a tendency, again, for these spiritual-minded pursuits to become purchased. And it is like a market, and it is like any other consumer culture lifestyle. I've witnessed, and again, I've partaken in the, par in the purchase of spiritual traditions. We must be vigilant, however, not to ignore the three-dimensional people set within the historical, the socioeconomic, or the political realities of oppression. Often that which can be exported out to those who are willing to pay for it come from the cultures or the, the, or the countries which have a lower socioeconomic structure than 
lived in a first world nation, so myself specifically living in Canada. I'm reflecting a lot on the psychedelic tourism at this particular moment. There's a, there's a huge uh, leaning on psychedelic tourism or eco-tourism, uh, shamanic tourism. But, and there are blog posts and essays and books written on the sale of um, spiritual relationship to plant medicine. And you know, very, I've seen more and more and more people uh, involved in plant medicine and bringing plant medicine and there there are very real challenges I have with that that come from a cultural appropriation perspective it also come from not understanding the context of the community not understanding the social political relationships of plants and and ceremonies and healers not understanding the psychological or the mythological context of any of these things which, which leads to uh, a very challenging way to walk. How do we walk? How do we walk in this? I've talked to solitary practitioners about solitary practitioners here before. And as like any fox, I observe my environment. And in the almost 30 years of observing, I've witnessed an increased withdrawal of the individual from the public ceremonies, public gatherings, uh, public things that are going on in my city. Right? The shamanic drumming circle that I was a part of sustained itself for 30 years. Through this time, I watched the greater pagan community become increasingly fragmented and less gratifying. I think a knee-jerk reaction is that individuals withdraw to their own private realms. And this is to, you know, whether you're seeking self-confirmation, self-gratification, aspects of self-growth or for healing. The search for self-identity is especially problematic, problematic in our society in which the, you know, because we have a stable, because the stable networks of kinship and the stable networks of community, they've really broken down. And perhaps this is an underlying symptom of why people flock to shopping malls, yoga classes, you know, insert whatever you want to insert into that, seeking an identity. And I think sometimes it really is to relieve the stark loneliness and the loss of extended families, perhaps a struggle to find out what now. Where do we as individual souls go as we watch and perhaps even play a role in the degradation and the loss of our inner communities, our families, and our social circles. I read a term, proto-community, and it was uh, associated with an essay. And one of the pictures used with the essay was of a music festival. The essay continued on and spoke of the onlooker and being, or, or as being part of the culture. So myself, I found myself as an onlooker. And I've been to lots of music festivals, when, especially when I was younger. My kids, I took my kids when they were really little to music festivals. So I understand the community from that perspective. This community is created by, you know, strangers who dress similar, uh, similar cultural products, whatever that is, you know, whether it's whatever that is. I don't want to name one or the other because we all have a different relationship to whatever our cultural products are and our gadgets. And this is almost as though there was a silent promise of gratification and or recognition through possession and display. So if you have this particular, you know, this particular hoodie or this particular furry on your body or have your makeup in this way or wear your angel wings or blah, 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 whatever it is, right? The essay spoke to the shopping mall self. I thought that was a fascinating line, the shopping mall self. And went on to talk about the seeking of gratification. And they even used the word, arguably, I think in an intelligent manner, they used the word salvation in consumption. It postulated that we're trapped in a lonely maze of desire and expenditure. That's kind of bleak, isn't it? So that's pretty, pretty bleak. So I don't quite take such a bleak role, but it is interesting to, to think about. So I ask, is a new age movement merely a commercialized gratification? In turn, only momentarily masking emptiness and loneliness in society. 
Are we seeking the other, the exoticized, as a way of connecting to our soul, genuinely mourning the loss of tribe and connection? Is that what we're doing? The shamanism I was introduced to shone a light on the pathway for the seeking of internal understanding and wholeness, right? I'm no stranger to the fact, the very fact, that my quest to seek information and even share information is part of my quest to survive as one of the tribeless, the familyless. In seeking to understand myself in the huge scheme of the world, I have walked and at times crossed the proverbial thin line between what is for public consumption and what is for specifically tribal consumption, that cultural appropriation. Through my search and my never-ending, even to this day, never-ending quest to share my love for shamanic practices, thoughts, and ideas, I truly believe I have gained my own sense of identity and belonging, which in turn I want to share, not only through my personal practice, not only through my podcast, but through my teaching and through the individual humans that I get the opportunity to speak with, to uh, write email messages back with, and to have now relationships in some form or other. When I mention that I practice shamanism, I know myself, and I'm sure many of you out there as well, you are almost with 100% regularity responded to with, Oh, I love Native spirituality. I live in a country that is rife with racism and inequality. And I see firsthand the romanticized image of Native Indians and their spirituality. I've met individuals over the years self-fashioning an identity and wearing this identity as a type of perhaps social solidarity, no matter how temporary, tenuous, or even anonymous these social relationships may be. Now, cricket fact here, when I go to a bookstore, I will often go to the titles in the Native American Studies section. It used to be called the Occult section. (laughs) That always made me giggle. Although in the Edmonton Public Library, they still have an Occult section, and they've separated the Native American Studies. They've actually done quite a bit of separating into what used to be the overall umbrella New Age categorization of books and and, uh, magazines. Now it's very specific, and all of the Native American titles and uh, in, in books written in, in relationship and in support of or in exploration of have now a fully singular uh, area of the library dedicated to them. Uh, and anything that deals with the occult is still, you know, still has a very specific Dewey Decimal system associated with it. And I'm aging myself here incredibly right now. And I'm all right with that. You know, I don't, I don't care that I'm in my 50s. So I often will go to the section uh, in the stores, and it always makes me giggle. In these sections, I've watched individuals strike up conversations, you know, on the basis of presumed shared interests. I know I have wondered if the people that I spoke to viewed themselves as part of an imagined community of like-minded people. In those very brief moments, from my own perspective, I hoped that I was able to convey pleasure and entail a feeling of belonging. However, as I chatted about earlier, the scattering of the pagan community in my city may be an indication that borrowed communities can never really satisfy an individual's yearnings for community belonging. Are we experiencing a growing pain of individualism or individuation? I think the failure of these communities with no shared histories, no social ties involving interdependence or daily interaction simply cannot satisfy individuals in these imagined circles, these covens and groups. They seem to grow quickly dissatisfied and then run off and imagine new circles, new groups, new friends, hence the never-satisfied seeker, the 
water skier on the lake of spirituality. So cultural appropriation, as you know and I know, is real and it does happen consistently. And we are now entering into a time where cultural barriers are disappearing, but people are desperately clinging to these older forms of interpreting life meaning. Comparing myths for years has helped me to understand not only the cultural connections to different symbols and beliefs, but to the psychological relationships as well. So can we? Can New Agers and New Shamans and New Pagans, etc., etc., can we really be broken down to a simple consumeristic movement? I think of crystals often when I think about this, and I and I don't, I, you know, I've talked about this before, and I've talked about, you know, the blowing up of mountains and how I find that atrocious, and you know, however many years ago. Crystals were just something that was new agey and woo-woo and nobody really believed in it. And now we have entire um, warehouses dedicated to gems and the wholesale um, and wholesale regulation of gems and, and how we can pick them up, where we go, where are the mines. And I have a huge issue uh, with that. Not because I don't like shiny, pretty things. Not because I don't like some of the most beautiful and amazing stones I mean, certainly, I love some beautiful things and would love to own many, many more. However, from my perspective, if I cannot use it all, I don't want to own it. If I don't already make use of what Spirit has so generously given to me, then what business do I have bringing more into my home if I don't already use what I already have? But that's my thinking. That doesn't have to be yours. That doesn't have to be your reality. This is my reality. And I'm just sharing with you my reality. It doesn't mean that this is yours. So that's where I think of it as being a consumeristic movement. And at times, I think the answer, simply put, is yes. The consumer market is savvy as fuck. And it recognizes and caters to the uninformed the ignorant and the just-don't-care seekers, propelling them to explore and express their newfound fascination with X, giving a false sense of belonging and identity solely through the purchase of goods that are sold under its rubric or under its form or under its fashion. Ad agencies, great marketers, recognize isolated individuals are more likely to seek identity through purchase. Cultural appropriation has economic benefit, but rarely to the benefit of the appropriated. Again, why am I talking about this? Because I have to remind myself where I stand. I have to take stock of my beliefs, my patterns, and I have to hold myself accountable. And I recognize at the same time that I am very, very fortunate to have found my path and have a heritage I can draw from. But I am also a first-generation Canadian. I am adopted, and I have no real ancestors registered on either Ancestry.com or 1, 2, and 3 and Me. As a fact, I find even more amusing Here in my whole life, I feel like an outsider. So I find shamanism and I find a path and a supportive spiritual relationship for this path. And even when I do find my heritage, my Finnish heritage, I'm still alone with very distant cousins, only found as relatives. The irony and the celestial belly laugh certainly is not lost upon me. I can assure that one of the uh, workshops that I did with Betsy Bergstrom. We were doing the Compassion Deep Session, and one of the things that we did in the evening was we did the uh, the seeth and the sitting and the oracle. And I brought to the feet of the oracle, what is the relationship and why am I constantly abandoned or why do I constantly feel alone? And to the credit of the oracle, what I found was probably some of the most profound words were 
perhaps you cannot look upon, I'm paraphrasing, but perhaps you can look upon it as not being abandoned, but rather free to do whatever you want and to connect with whoever you want. So again, there are always more than more than one side to every single medicine wheel. That's for darn sure. I'm questioning because I have the luxury to do so. And I'm digging into community and I'm finding community through practice because that is what has worked for me. And through that time, I have witnessed implosions and explosions of different side communities. What drives us to find and perhaps ultimately reject community? Does appropriation give us what we're fighting for, perhaps at arm's length, and that being community? If we have no shared experience and are not interdependent and do not share similar myths and stories, then what? These new issues that are demanding to be dealt with can no longer be addressed in the older ways of looking at them, whether from political or religious pulpits. Because let's face it, many of us have come straight out of the religious families or one or two generations away from going to church sort of families. And maybe never were, but the majority of humans that I speak to, at least in North America, do speak to having an ongoing or a relationship in their family to the to the Christian mythology and to the Christian church, myself included. So what is this social media platforms? You know, that's another way of looking at it. Can we, you know, these issues that are need to be addressed and dealt with and the older ways of looking at things. They can't, the social media platforms, they exclude humanity from knowing and understanding itself. So there, that even isn't a way to explore self. There are no simple answers. And I suspect if there was a simple answer, I would still keep digging. Seeking spirit in a barren land can describe parts of my journey. And likely, my constant listener, you as well. And the path of anyone dedicated is lonely and can feel barren. Shamanism, from my understanding personally and through conversations with others, is a lonely path. I don't believe this path has been easy inside tribe or outside. I have spoken about my own experience outside the proverbial circle. We have all heard that tired, well, tired to me adage anyway, of we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Further to that, though, I would add that our human experience is constantly shifting. The continuous movement from being held within to experience that spiral moving out, changing long-held notions of family, community, and society. Our souls are still getting used to, on this earth school anyway, living alone and isolated. And as we age, you and me, dear listener, will watch how the ripples of loneliness, isolation, and divisiveness change the flow of the waters of humanity. I pay attention to the world immediately surrounding me and the world outside me and its continual influence. The divisive climate we find ourselves in will only create more ripples of loneliness and isolation. Find your path, dear listener. Find your true north. Walk softly and consciously. But above all, walk with conscience. Practice alert awareness. Make the unconscious conscious. Be mindful where your path comes from and walk it with as much integrity as humanly possible. We are where we are because we are seeking. And we are seeking because we are given the opportunity to seek. We are devoid of path. We are, some of us, devoid of family. Some of us, devoid of community. Some of us, 
perversely isolated. I don't have an answer as to how to change that. I do know that I have made beautiful community, beautiful friends, and have shared in-depth and astounding conversations with people on this path of self-exploration and shamanism. I know that I have been given opportunities that many people have not to explore, to understand, and to embrace my own Finnish heritage, my own Finnish shamanism. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Even though I'm tribeless, I have form and function. I have stories and I have psychological relationship. I understand from a lonely and isolated and uh, very clever marketing industry how cultural appropriation has come about and how it has come about so easily. I recognize that each of us is doing the best that we possibly can. All I want to do is let you know I'm in solidarity with you. I've made mistakes. I've found pathways that were not mine. I've tried to pick up rituals, ceremonies, ideologies that are not mine and have ultimately found they do not fit. I am fortunate to be seeking in a world that gives me permission to seek. I am grateful to live in the first world nation that can allow me to seek freely without being persecuted for my beliefs, for my speaking out, for my structure, and for the love of my life, my spirits. I hope your life reflects the beauty that spirit sees in you. I hope that your self reflects the inner wisdom that you seek, you already have, and you share with others. I am enamored by you, my constant listener, my semi-constant listener, and yes, even you, my first-time listener. I'm enamored by your experiences. I'm enamored by your trips and traps. I'm enamored by how you pick yourselves up, how you move forward, how you question the world around you, how you continue to question the world around you despite being questioned back. I cannot walk this path with you, but I can walk my path parallel. And between us in this parallel path, Perhaps we can feed, nourish, and share stories so that we are not the disenfranchised, isolated community, that we do have shared understanding. We do have shared social knowledge. We do have. And on that note, as always, I am humbled and happy and honored that you have shared time with me, that you have allowed my voice to enter into your ear, into your room, into your sphere of influence, and allowed me to share my words, my thoughts, and my ideas. It is a thin line between cultural appropriation and freedom of expression. I ask you to be vigilant and conscience, conscious And if you're unsure, reach out and speak. If you're unsure, ask the questions. Until next time, which will be Honest Goodness, Winter Solstice. I'll chat with you then. Thank you again for joining us here on the Shaman's Way podcast. If you have any questions, would like to make a request for a future episode, or if you're looking for other shamanic resources, including free drumming tracks, please visit us at shamansway.net. Until the next episode, be well, everyone.